Welcome to Movie Beef, where we look at and review some older movies that aren't in theaters. So, I recently had a surplus of free time because my internet went out. This is pretty normal, I struggle to pay bills as it is, so sometimes I have to let the internet lapse while I just focus on other things and work. Which is why if you want to see more of me, you should totally support me on Patreon. Here's a list of all the generous people currently donating to the Chunky Beef YouTube experience. Part of those other things I mentioned earlier is watching movies in my collection. I've got tons of DVDs and Blu-rays I've saved up from buying them at bargain bin prices during the Black Friday sales for the past decade or so. Mostly back when I was working and can actually afford to splurge $10 for the entire series of Harry Potter movies on DVD. Most of those are still in the wrapping after all these years. Now it's time to unwrap some of these good, or maybe not so good, movies and take brief looks at them. For the sake of time, most of these reviews won't be exceedingly long and will probably contain spoilers. If there's a movie you want to watch without being spoiled, you should totally come back later after you've watched it and see if our opinions align. Alright, here we go. Pieces, pieces! Yes, thank you! Here's one of my favorite movies from one of my favorite actors, Simon Pegg. Odds are you've probably seen Simon Pegg in movies over the past two decades because the guy basically never turns down a role when it's offered to him. Paul is a movie about two huge sci-fi loving nerds, played by Simon Pegg and his friend Nick Frost, who've taken a vacation to America to visit Comic-Con before journeying through America's UFO heartland. They meet the titular alien, Paul, who's voiced by Seth Rogen, and their vacation turns into an effort to save Paul so he can return to his home planet. I tried my best to set my biases aside for this movie, and even having not watched it in years, I still found myself enjoying it quite a bit. Seth Rogen is, at least in my opinion, a better voice actor than an actual actor. He nails his role as Paul, and it's smooth and believable. I tried to imagine the voice of Paul as literally any other voice actor I'm aware of, and I don't honestly think they could have picked a better person for the role he fits that perfectly. In terms of the actual movie, it's pretty cut and dry. It doesn't really try to do anything with a genre that hasn't already been done before. At best, it's a slightly more interesting version of E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Simon Pegg's movies like Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz were genre-subverting masterpieces and did extremely well because of that subversion, but Paul doesn't really subvert the genre and is a more straightforward movie in comparison to his previous works. It's obviously not a parody, and it's not subversive, so then what does it become? One of the major problems Paul suffers from is that the downtimes are too slow and too long, and the few uptimes aren't typically very engaging. While it does a good job of running gags, some of the jokes are a little bland and feel a bit forced at times. There are numerous aspects to the movie that were added that just sort of feel like they didn't need to be. For example, the inclusion of Simon Pegg's love interest in the movie, played by Kristen Wiig, Wig, Wig, I have no idea, it just gave me Adam Sandler vibes. It felt like she was included just to add some sexual tension to a movie that didn't really need it. Otherwise, her entire role in the movie is essentially concluded maybe 20 minutes after her introduction, which simply makes the movie more crowded than it already is when she stops being useful to the plot. So while I think Paul is definitely one of Simon Pegg's better movies, it still struggles a lot and doesn't really feel like a Simon Pegg movie. It feels more like someone took the script for an old-school Adam Sandler romantic comedy and then added an alien to it. Would I recommend watching it? Eh, well, it's definitely one of those movies you'll want to give a chance if you like any of Simon Pegg's other works, but I wouldn't really go out of my way to watch it because there's really nothing else for you here otherwise. You know, I don't like to talk about Dark Forces, Randall. Let me help you, what are your jam, Grandma? Grandma, what was it like to be on the holiday side? Late that night, I awoke from my sleep, hearing unknown voices laughing and saying. Perhaps the crowning masterpiece of Kevin Smith's career, Clerks 2 is also one of my favorite all-time movies. The full-color sequel to the black-and-white cult classic, Clerks, Clerks 2 follows Dante, played by Brian O'Halloran, 
and Randall, played by Jeff Anderson, as they struggle through their mundane lives and boring fast food job. When the status quo is threatened by Dante's impending nuptials, shenanigans ensue as Randall tries to send off his best friend while dealing with the emotions of possibly losing him at the same time. Clerks 2 is a movie that, like the original Clerks, speaks to all the people that have ever worked in shitty jobs longer than they probably intended to. The sort of people who feel like they've wasted their potential, that their life passed them by while they stood in place. It also says a lot about how easily we can get stuck in our ways, fearful of change, though the movie doesn't do a whole lot to imply that major change can be good and healthy. Still, it's a comedy and a lighthearted one at that. The pop culture references in the movie's time should be easily picked up by anyone older than 20, so it hasn't lost its luster there yet. And anyone who's even remotely aware of Kevin Smith's history and cinematography, it goes without saying that Ben Affleck and Jason Mewes are present here as well. While Clerks 2 may not be perfect, it rarely leaves you bored, and Kevin Smith did a great job at at least making the movie's downtime feel less like downtime. The only thing that really doesn't mesh well with the movie is the big dance number in the second half of the movie. It seems really out of place and kind of destroys the movie's pacing, at least in my opinion. Still, when the movie's most fatal flaw is a 3 or 4 minute musical number, it could definitely be worse. With the new characters we see the most of, played by Trevor Fer- Furman and Rosario-, Rosario Dawson, respectively, you can generally gauge their place in the story and their complementary, perfect choices for their roles. Rosario Dawson, especially, is a very talented actress, and if she seems familiar, it's probably because she's also very active. Specifically, she's participated in several of the Marvel TV series. Hell, look at the box art and tell me that they weren't fully aware that Rosario Dawson had the most potential of anyone there. So, would I recommend Clerks 2? Absolutely, though if you want to actually give a shit about the characters, I suggest watching the original Clerks first. Clerks 2 sort of assumes that you've watched the first movie and know about Dante and Randall's friendship, and are also familiar with Jay and Silent Bob, played by Jason Mewes and Kevin Smith respectively. What do you want? Well, come on, what do you want? A snot rag? Right, another fucking mongoloid. Marcus, get this kid off me before he pisses on me, all right? Fuck with my beard. It's not real. No shit. Well, it was real, but you see, I got sick and all the hair fell out, so I had to wear this fucking thing. How'd you get sick? I loved a woman who wasn't clean. Also one of my favorite movies, and at least more relevant to Christmas and Die Hard, is Bad Santa. The movie stars Billy Bob Thornton, the lead John Ritter, Lauren Graham, and Bernie Mac, and it involves Thornton's character looting malls during Christmas time by posing as a mall Santa. It's about as feel-good as raunchy comedies get, it's hilarious when it needs to be, though not always when it wants to be, and I'm shocked it hasn't been tapped for its meme potential. The story is predictable, to the point where you can pretty much guess just by the briefest of synopsis how the movie ends. Though Bad Santa isn't really the sort of movie you watch specifically for the story. I'll be honest, this is probably one of the lower movies on my list of favorites, like probably top 100. It's primarily because this movie gives you no real motivation to rewatch it, except maybe once every couple of years. In fact, the last time I watched Bad Santa was back in 2015, so I was way past due to watch it again anyway. This general lack of replayability doesn't necessarily make Bad Santa a bad movie. It's just simply not the kind of movie you can watch every other month and it not get dull. Movies like Back to the Future or Rocky Heart or Picture Show fit that sort of infinitely rewatchable description, but Bad Santa falls way outside that territory. It's tough to gauge what makes Bad Santa a good enough movie to watch and enjoy, but doesn't really push it past the line into genuine movie notoriety. Uh, perhaps it's because of the Christmas theme, maybe it's the over-the-top adult humor? Whatever the case may be, if you look at list of best movies that fall within those parameters, you'll be digging a while to find Band Santa on those lists, if it appears at all. I haven't really had a chance to look, but reviewer's intuition says I'm probably right. Everyone has those mediocre, or even bad, movies that we enjoy despite its middling or low quality. Bad Santa happens to be one of those movies for me. It's not a great movie, but it's not a terrible movie either. It just is. It exists. 
and I usually won't pass up an opportunity to watch it if it's been a while since the last time. Would I suggest watching it? Well, if you've never watched it before and you like R-rated adult comedies like, say, Hot Tub Time Machine, I'd say it's definitely worth a shot. Hello? <clears throat> Tracy, it's Phil. Phil, where the hell are you guys? I'm freaking out. <sighs> yeah, listen. Uh... <sighs> we fucked up. What are you talking about? The bachelor party, the whole night, it's... Things got out of control and, uh... We lost Doug. Yeah, I know, there's technically three Hangover movies, but I only have the first two, so that's what you're gonna get, damn it. For the uninitiated, The Hangover is about four friends who go to Vegas for a bachelor party before one of the four's wedding. Things don't quite work out the way they intended, and so the majority of the movie is three of the four looking for their fourth while piecing together what happened the previous night. If The Hangover sounds familiar, it should. The movie came out, I think, in 2009 and was so wildly popular that they greenlit sequels pretty much immediately. It's one of those movies that you can suggest watching to just about anyone with a decent sense of humor. It's that rare sort of movie that comes along every 5 to 10 years and completely flips the genre on its head, completely revitalizes it, and spawns numerous clones and pretenders. The Hangover was one of those movies. It's extremely hilarious, has some spectacular acting, the plot is interesting from beginning to end, the way the story's told flows smoothly, and the cameos are top notch. I could sit here all day and talk about what makes The Hangover such a spectacular movie, but there's better movie reviewers out there who can outline the intricacies in a shorter amount of time than I can, and people have been analyzing it for nearly a decade to start out its intricacies. As for Hangover 2, it's basically just a retelling of Hangover 1. The last movie on the list, and one that's not a comedy. You can imagine what sorts of movies I prefer to watch by now, I'd hope. Anyway, Life of Pi is a movie about an Indian man recanting the tale of his life, as well as his harrowing survival at sea after a shipwreck. One of the things that really sticks out about Life of Pi is that it knows how to spend its time well. It gives you all the details you need for it to tell you a story, but it doesn't linger long on the unimportant things. It knows how to avoid overstaying its welcome. As you can imagine by the box art, the titular character's survival at sea makes up for most of the movie, and while that doesn't seem especially interesting, they don't let you get bored. I think that's a lot of the reason why Life of Pi turned out as good a movie as it did. It kept you interested, and the visuals are spectacular. Unfortunately, it's pretty easy to figure out what's CGI in it and what's not, and the story has some aspects that seem inconsistent or don't make sense. So fully enjoying the movie requires suspending your disbelief more than what's demanded of you from the average movie. One of the movie's major themes is religion, but more specifically within that theme is the concept of faith. These things are tapped constantly throughout the movie, but not in a demeaning or condescending way that heavily religious movies sometimes fall into, sometimes intentionally, but often unintentionally. It also approaches themes of acceptance, loss, and the acceptance of loss. It's a very emotionally heavy movie, especially toward the end. Would I suggest watching it? Absolutely. Actually, I'd suggest everyone watch it, even if the topics it approaches aren't quite up your alley or might make you uneasy. All too often, we refuse to challenge the status quo, and if I can break my comedy marathon for a deeper, more thought-provoking movie, you should try something different as well. Anyway, that's it for these quick little reviews. Well, the video itself is pretty lengthy at this point, but the reviews are kind of short. Maybe not so short, but you get the idea. Thanks for sticking it out to the end. If you like what we have here on the Chunky Beef YouTube experience, definitely subscribe and follow us on social media. Links will be in the description below. See you soon.